All of you already know Brian Stratton very well, so we can skip the introductions and go straight to the meat of the class. Welcome. Well, thank you for that uh, concise but accurate introduction. Uh, so, uh, uh, Neil, would you be willing to lead us in prayer to open the class? Oh, gracious God, this is indeed your special day, your day of hope, and we rejoice in it. He is risen, hallelujah. The Lord is giving us hope, giving us life, giving us joy. We thank you for this time together on this special morning. And we ask that you come with your Holy Spirit and anoint this time, that it may truly serve you and your purposes for our lives. Thank you for Brian and thank you for our time together. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Nell. I knew I called on the right person. I felt a little few chills uh, during that prayer. Very nice, very nice indeed. So. Well, I know it's a weird title after the after, uh, but it is Easter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know it's sometimes hard to get folks to, uh, to lead uh, classes on Easter because of the holiday and things. So usually whenever, uh, you know, you need to go deep in the bench, I'm usually <laughs> the last guy sitting on the, uh, on the stoop. So I'm usually here to, uh, to, to pinch hit as it, as it need be. So after the after, I'm going to be talking about uh, different Christian conceptions of the afterlife. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will be instructive. Uh, I do encourage you that if you have questions or comment uh, to please unmute yourself or uh, say something in the chat because, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, I'm always glad to hear from others. Okay. All right, well, let's first off start off with uh, something that frosted my cornflakes just a little bit uh, that happened at the start of this pandemic, right? A group of Hollywood celebrities decided that they were going to get together and they would make a video and they wouldn't be wearing makeup, but they wanted to, you know, and they were just going to film themselves in their living room, show they're just like us and to show their support for all the people that might have COVID. And so they all get together and get the bright idea that they're going to record a song to honor those that might have COVID. And the song they chose was John Lennon's Imagine. So you have a lot of elderly people that have COVID and are afraid they may not make it. You have younger people that have COVID who are also concerned about whether or not they're going to make it or not. They're thinking this may be the last breaths they take. And they hear these wonderful celebrities saying, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. Now, I don't know about you folks, but if I thought I was soon going to shuffle off this mortal coil and join the choir invisible, I think the last thing I would want somebody telling me is, imagine there's no heaven. That's not what I consider to be a terribly comforting uh, message uh, <laughs> to give people, especially as they uh, may expire. Uh, but let me say this, um, you know, uh, I appreciated their efforts, I suppose, I mean, celebrities, is there anything they don't know, right? They're just, they're, just, they're just so supportive of us all. Anyway, one should not be sarcastic on Easter, so I better move into my material here uh, and stop there. So let's talk about the after the after. And before I get into that, um, I want to talk about uh, a couple of philosophers that have influenced how Christians have tended to think about the afterlife. Uh, but then I want to talk about what the Bible uh, might actually say, uh, and then uh, perhaps we'll conclude with some reflections on that. So the first thing we need to talk about, though, before we get into the idea of the afterlife, 
is we need to talk about the nature of the human person. How are we to understand a human being? And probably the philosopher that influenced most of the early Christian church fathers uh, who were trying to put Christianity together with the best learning of their time uh, was Plato. And so Plato's understanding of the human person greatly influenced uh, these early church fathers. And then in the modern period, probably the philosopher that influenced uh, modern thought most and how uh, mo modern people uh, think about the person uh, is uh, Rene Descartes. So let me say just a little bit about uh, Plato and what he thought about a person and then what Descartes thought about a person. And then we'll look at what the Bible thought about a person, all right? So Plato, Plato believed that a human being was basically composed of two parts, that we were composed of bodies, which were material, physical objects, and we were composed of souls, which are immaterial or intelligible as opposed to physical. And for Plato, the soul was composed of three parts. There was a lower part that was associated uh, with our appetites, our bodily needs, our need for survival. That's the part of the soul closest and sort of like the intermediary for the body. You have the will, which houses the higher emotions and is what inspires us to make choices. And then you have the highest part of the soul, which Plato believed was reason, because he thought reason was most like uh, the immaterial world, which was superior to the physical world. Now, the main thing they need to remember about that is Plato, in his dialogues, has Socrates make numerous arguments for the immortality of the soul. The body perishes, the body goes away, but for Plato, the soul endures. And uh, we won't get into too much about that, but not only did Plato believe the soul endured our physical death, he actually believed that our souls uh, were uh, immortal, eternal, uh, and that uh, all of our souls existed uh, before they ever inhabited bodies. So this idea of the immortal soul. So a human being is two parts, a body which dies, decays, it's over and done with, and a soul which endures is permanent and goes on. Uh, so, now Descartes, in the modern world, and then I'll uh, talk about the Bible, Descartes had an even more radical view than Plato. Uh, he also believed that human beings were composed of two fundamental parts or substances, body, which for him, again, was physical, and mind, or sometimes Descartes would call mind soul. He treated those as if they were the two same things. And one of the arguments that Descartes makes for this dualism, but he's got a bunch of them, but I won't get into those because Carol's probably thinking, you need to get to the Bible and quit talking about this philosophy, right? But Descartes believed that the mind was more fundamental and it's really what made a person a person. And of course, the mind or the soul survives the body. The body dies, decays, it's over and done with. For Descartes, the mind is undying. Now, Descartes didn't agree with Plato about this whole reincarnation thing uh, or pre-existence thing necessarily, but notice that idea, the idea that a human being is composed of two fundamental parts. The more enduring part can exist independently of the physical part, and so any afterlife for both Plato and for Descartes, any afterlife is going to be non-physical. In other words, it is our minds or our reason that survives death. When the body's gone, the body is over and done with, and it is no longer necessary. What is eternal is the immaterial aspect of a person, the mental or the soul, okay? 
And we'll see how this relates to Christianity uh, <laughs> before it's awfully long. But anyway, any questions about any of that or comments before I move on? All right. The New Testament scholar, Oscar Kuhlmann, gave a lecture, uh, it's been quite a few years ago now, I should have looked up the date, uh, but uh, Oscar Kuhlmann argued that many Christians had misunderstood the notion of the person in the Hebrew Bible. Kuhlmann, the title of his lecture, which was later expanded into a book, was called The Immortality of the Soul or The Resurrection of the Body. So the immortality of the soul or the resurrection of the body. Plato and Descartes basically hold for an immortality of the soul. But in the Bible, and Kuhlmann goes through everything from uh, in Genesis when God creates uh, Adam and breathes into him the breath of life, right? The spirit, right? The ruach that in the Hebrew Bible, human beings aren't understood as two completely separate or discrete units of body and soul, but rather we're more like uh, a holistic creature. Instead of saying body and soul, the way Plato or Descartes might, we should say body hyphen soul, because that's what a human being is. To be an authentic human being, you do need to have a physical body and you need to have the spirit or soul, which is given by God. And it is this unity that makes a person a person. Okay. Everybody with me on that so far? Not ahead. Right? Okay. So, so that for, for the Bible, physical in existence is intrinsically important to what it means to be human. It's not enough to simply be an immaterial soul. And in the Hebrew Bible, well, uh, uh, let's look at uh, some of the things because this is incredibly hard to tease out in the Bible. And uh, uh, hopefully this won't offend anybody. Uh, I never know, right? If, we, if push came to shove, we would just have to say this. How the Bible actually understands the afterlife is incredibly ambiguous. It is very hard to systematize all the things that the Bible has to say about the possibility of life after death. And uh, for those of you that might have heard the phrase progressive revelation, right? That things change over time, even in scripture as more insight is given. Probably no subject illustrates this idea better than the notion of the afterlife. So uh, let's look at just a couple of typical passages uh, from uh, the Old Testament. Michael, have you got the uh, PowerPoint ready for us there? Yes, just about to share that now. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to the first. Okay, well, the second, I guess. <laughs> By the way, Carol and I debated the background color on this slide, just so you know. You know, it's, uh, as you can see, they're very vibrant. And Carol said, doesn't that look Easter and doesn't that look cheery? Uh, but because I was thinking about the afterlife, I was thinking more it looked like the judgment of God and maybe the fires of hell were licking up. So, but uh, I think Carol's right. I think it really is more, uh, more Easter cheery uh, than the other. Maybe we could have put some flame sound effects or something on there. But anyway, let's look at two passages that are fairly typical from the Old Testament. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. The living know that they will die but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, and even the memory of them is lost. And then Psalm uh, 6, 5, 
For in death, there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? Now, that is not a real optimistic message, is it, for a, a good Easter Sunday, right? Uh, you know, you could almost hear the writer of Ecclesiastes singing Imagine Now, right? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, one of the things about the Hebrew Bible, and a lot of folks don't recognize this, is that in the Hebrew Bible, there is no real belief in a robust afterlife until after the Babylonian captivity. The first clear-cut statement of the resurrection of the dead that's not ambiguous is in the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter, where a resurrection of the dead is clearly taught. So we're talking really late within uh, Judaism uh, or in biblical, the pe biblical period of Judaism before an idea of uh, a resurrection uh, really gets uh, pushed and affirmed. Now, you may say, well, I don't know about that. Well, stop and think about it. Let's think of the New Testament. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, right, have big disagreements, don't they? In fact, if you remember in Acts, Paul's able to wiggle out of trouble because he pits the two against one another in a theological debate. Anybody remember what that theological debate Paul instituted was? Resurrection of the dead. Yes, thanks, yes. Jack. The resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe it. The Pharisees did. Now, one of the reasons why that that came about is the Sadducees only accepted the Torah as authoritative. They rejected all the other writings. The Pharisees accepted the other writings, including the prophets like Daniel. And so therefore they have a text to defend the idea, but the resurrection of the dead is not found in the Torah, in the law of Moses. All right. Now let me just say a word about that word Sheol, and then I'll try to to move here. Sheol undergoes a lot of different changes in the Hebrew Bible. Sometimes Sheol means simply the grave. So going down to Sheol basically just means you're being buried. But as uh, you see a movement as things change over time, Sheol sort of moves from simply being the grave to this kind of shadowy uh, shade world where all the dead go. So whether you're a righteous person or whether you're a wicked person doesn't matter. Sheol is simply the realm of the dead. And even though there's some kind of existence there, and it's not always clear in the Hebrew Bible exactly what that existence looks like, even though there is some kind of existence, that is not consoling. It's a kind of afterlife of sorts, but it is not a pleasant one because in effect, if you think about it in Sheol, you have no body, right? You're simply a shade, right? What Plato and Descartes would have thought, hey, that's where it's at, man. In Sheol, for the Hebrews, no, if you're not embodied, just to be some kind of intangible thing is not a good afterlife. And if you stop and think about it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to think that way, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me illustrate this uh, with a story, uh, with a scene from Harry Potter, right? Any of you read the Harry Potter books? Some of you maybe, right? Or at least maybe some of you have seen the film. Anybody? Hard to see there. Anyway, there's a scene in Harry Potter for Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Each house at Hogwarts has its own, uh, own little room, its area, and each house has its own ghost, right? I mean, after all, they're wizards, and you know, you've got to have ghosts floating around. 
And the Gryffindor ghost is nearly headless Nick. And he's called nearly headless because he was almost decapitated. Uh, they're just a, well, anyway, let's not get into his morbid uh, physical description, right? But nearly headless Nick and the ghosts celebrate not their birthdays, they celebrate their death days because that's when they become ghosts, right? And so Nick asked Harry, Ron, and Hermione to come and celebrate his uh, death day with him. And so they agreed to do that. And he says, oh, we'll have this marvelous feast and you can eat anything you want. Well, so they're all there and Harry and Ron walk up to the table to see this food and it is so repulsive that they begin to gag and they almost throw up because it's rotten, it stinks, it's horrible. Now, <laughs> if you stop and think about it, if a ghost doesn't have a body, does a ghost have taste buds? So, and a ghost doesn't have taste buds, right? So, and when the children complain, uh, Nick says basically to them, uh, well, we can't really taste anything. So we let this food go as long as we can, just hoping, hoping that we can taste it. Now, you see what I'm getting? I'm using that to sort of illustrate this idea among the ancient Hebrews that to live in Sheol, if you can call it a life, an afterlife in Sheol, is not a terribly pleasant thing. You cannot enjoy many of the things that make life wonderful simply because we don't have bodies, right? So this idea of a disembodied existence would be attractive to some, uh, would not be attractive uh, to the ancient Hebrews. That's why they stress resurrection, right? As opposed to simply an intangible existence. So don't worry, folks, you will get your taste buds back. Right? Well, it talks about eating in heaven, doesn't it, in the book of Revelation, right? Talks about having a banquet in the last day, yeah. So we don't want to be, we don't want to have a table of filthy, disgusting food if we're going to banquet with Jesus, do we? I mean, we're wanting a really good spread, right? So anyway, uh, that gives you an idea about Sheol, but it sort of moves into a place. Now, in the Septuagint, Sheol, the Hebrew word that's used for this shadow existence, gets translated, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, translated as Hades. And that's important because that relates to the Greek understanding of the afterlife, uh, Hades, right? Anyway, uh, Michael, could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, we'll get to the New Testament here in just a second. Now, does anybody have any questions, though, before I say a few things about this idea? I'm happy to take them, folks. All right. Well, let's take that uh, thing about uh, uh, the dead know nothing, etc., and let me mention uh, one of the theories that some Christians have about what happens to human beings uh, in the afterlife, and then we'll get to another. And I didn't even know that there was a name for this position. I just found that out myself as I was uh, doing some research on this. But there is a uh, position that's usually identified called mortalism. Mortalism. And there are three uh, basic uh, types of positions, they're not the same, uh, that fall under this category. And the first is what uh, John Calvin called and actually uh, tried to condemn in his writings, soul sleep. And those that defend uh, the type of mortalism that's known as soul sleep basically says that when we die, our souls go to sleep. And that we're in this sleeping state, 
it's not a conscious state, but that we are going to sleep until the time of the resurrection from the dead. So uh, being dead for the mortalist would be, uh, at this version, the soul sleep version, would be like taking a really deep dreamless nap until the time uh, when God brings you forth from the dead. And usually, uh, as I was reading, one of the uh, people that was defending this view, he said, even though you may have been asleep for uh, 2,000 years, it'll just seem like yesterday. You'll just wake up refreshed and ready to go, right? <laughs> That'd be some serious morning breath, wouldn't it, if you'd been asleep for 2,000 years? But anyway, the second version of mortalism does not hold that we go to sleep. It holds we are really, truly dead. There is no conscious or subconscious or any kind of consciousness that when you're dead, you're dead until the resurrection. And then God will bring us forth from the dead uh, reconstitute the human person. But this, uh, uh, there's, you know, instead of an, you know, uh, an after, the afterlife in this model would be the resurrection. In the soul sleep model, you could say that the resurrection is the after the afterlife. Right? And we'll get into uh, some other uh, ways of thinking about it in just a bit. Uh, there's a third strand. Uh, this has only emerged uh, pretty much in the modern period. And uh, this version of mortalism, uh, if you thought the first two aren't terribly encouraging, uh, this one may be even less so. Uh, this one holds that all the language about in the Bible about a resurrection or an afterlife is merely symbolic. And it's talking about having a heightened or better state in this life. So resurrection is just a symbol or the afterlife is just a symbol uh, for the kind of personal transformation uh, we undergo here. And when you're gone, well, you're gone. Very hard to square that with the New Testament, right? Very hard. But you have to uh, interpret almost the entire New Testament uh, as simply a symbolic statement of sort of an existential uh, kind of thing. And you can see this in some of the existentialist theologians, uh, uh, but I don't want to get into those. We're already, I've already led you far astray from, you know, from, thing. but anyway. So this is one argument, this mortalism. And they have texts. Right? I mean, they can use the Ecclesiastes text or whatever. Um, but then there's another group of Christians who argue that for what is called an intermediate state. So we have our mortalists, uh, you know, death, then resurrection. And then there are, you have some Christians who argue for what they call an intermediate state. That is, something happens in that period between death and resurrection. And whatever that is that's happening there is indeed a conscious existence of some sort. And some of the passages that folks use to defend the idea that there's some kind of immediate uh, consciousness uh, we got our second slide up there, the rich man and Lazarus, right? They both die. The rich man, open, dives, opens his eyes in hell. Uh, Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. And that seems to imply that there's some kind of immediate conscious state for both those two. Now, of course, the mortalists uh, would argue against this. Well, this is just a parable, right? Uh, so you can't really use that as a picture of the afterlife. Uh, but there is, you know, again, these things are debated back and forth. But let's take Luke 23, 43, the thief on the cross, right? 
And when the thief says to Jesus, Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise, right? So that would seem to indicate some kind of uh, immediate conscious state. So who are some of the defenders of this? Well, uh, uh, almost all the early church fathers, uh, Irenaeus, uh, Clement of Alexandria, uh, many of the Orthodox uh, fathers, John of Damascus, etc., basically held this, that upon death, there is uh, uh, paradise, which will be where we dwell when the resurrection occurs. And then there's, and they use different names for it. Some of them just call it heaven, right? But it's sort of like a waiting area for the righteous uh, that uh, are waiting for the resurrection to take place. And then there are two other levels. <laughs> uh, there is Hades, which is usually the word that's used to describe the holding state for the damned and where they exist until the resurrection. And then at the resurrection, of course, uh, uh, in the book of Revelation, we know that it's, well, we'll get to that verse later if we have time. You, you know, it's not a pleasant end, right? The, 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 the sea give up the dead that are in it. Uh, hell gives up the Hades, gives up the dead that are in it. And then they're cast into the lake of fire, right? So you've got these four stages. Uh, but for those that hold this view, it is the resurrection that's key. Those that are existing in these in-between states already know what their fate is, and those existing in these fates uh, or in these states, uh, for the righteous, it is a pleasant thing, but they are awaiting the body. They're still conscious, but waiting to be reunited, to be a full person again, uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know what the damned would look forward to in that. Uh, maybe that'll uh, the, the resurrection will hold off as long as possible, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course, in one of the most horrible things that John Calvin ever wrote, <laughs> John Calvin said that the righteous in heaven will hear the cries of the damned, but they will hear those cries and anguishing wails of the damned as the praise of God's justice. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> anyway, uh, Augustine, of course, held for this uh, these intermediate states, uh, as did many others. Uh, Augustine argued, he brought something new. Augustine argued that uh, that during this intermediate state for the righteous, uh, that they would basically go through uh, uh, a state of purification. That part of what they're doing is, uh, while they're waiting there, uh, is getting ready to be resurrected so that they will be more Christ-like, more holy. So they spend that time in prayer. They spend that time in spiritual improvement uh, in, in order to become more purified. And of course, there are some folks, even though Augustine doesn't have this idea himself, uh, there are some folks that see this as maybe the forerunner uh, for the Catholic notion of purgatory. Right. And by the way, Augustine did think he had scripture to justify this. Uh, he used the, the end of the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, where it talks about human works being burned up and tried in the fire. Right? And I'll just let you folks read that on your own whether we get into it in detail. Uh, but Augustine did think he had scriptural warrant for saying that the purification of the human person uh, will take place after death, right? It doesn't just stop with the end of life, okay? And then uh, at the resurrection then, hopefully uh, we will be uh, what we should be and can uh, enter in uh, to bliss, okay? Ryan, I have a quick question. Yeah, sure, Henry. Uh, where is limbo in all this? Ah, well, limbo, <laughs> it started fairly early as a way to try to deal with that belief about Christ. You know, as we say in the creeds, 
that Christ descended into hell. So uh, limbo became, and Dante is the one that, but Dante's relying on some of the theology of his own time. Limbo is basically the outer layer of hell, right? You know, if, if you're just barely in hell if you're in limbo, right? So you're not being punished for anything, but it's where the righteous pagans went. Uh, it was a place so that people like Plato, Aristotle, uh, Julius Caesar, depending on who they thought were righteous pagans, right, uh, that had lived before the Christian message. Uh, and uh, they weren't tortured. If you were a righteous pagan, basically, you were allowed to enjoy all earthly delights, but not the spiritual ones. Right? And if you think about the, the virtues, justice, right, temperance, courage, prudence, right, the pagans could enjoy that in all of its fullness. But the three greatest virtues, faith, hope, and charity, were denied them because they didn't know Christ. And then, Henry, I'll add one other thing. They had this thing for the righteous pagans, but then there was a theological debate in the 1300s about what happens to unbaptized babies. Because, you know, you've got to be baptized to be part of a Christian family, right? And so in addition to the limbo for the unrighteous, uh, 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 for the righteous, limbo for the righteous pagans, you also then get a limbo uh, for the unbaptized infants. And again, those infants, uh, they're not punished or they're not tortured, even though this is technically one of the uh, areas of hell. Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, Dante gives you the best geographical map of how folks thought, right, about hell in those days, because you have all these different layers, right? And, you know, so, you know, you can get, you got your, uh, you know, your, uh, your, your, your AAA travel guide to hell in Dante's Inferno, right? So if, so if you want to negotiate the various things that are there. But um, so that's what, yeah, so limbo emerges then, right? And this is a way, and the babies, ah, you know, cause we worry about the babies, don't we? The babies don't get to enjoy the supernatural virtues cause they've not been baptized, but they get to enjoy all the natural pleasures that a baby can enjoy. So that's some consolation, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's basically where it comes from. It, it, Thanks. It, it, Thank it, you. It, yeah, sure. Other questions or comments? All right, well, let me just mention then, uh, I did try to track down, uh, you know, these theological debates and the Roman Catholic Church uh, follows Augustine uh, to a great extent and does believe that the righteous who die exist in this state of uh, bliss until full completion of the resurrection. John Calvin, I mentioned him earlier, John Calvin argued that the same thing, that the righteous exist in a state of bliss until the resurrection. Luther, hard to know, right? Luther and scholars, I, as I was reading about this stuff, scholars of Luther have this tremendous argument about whether Luther taught soul sleep or whether he thought uh, uh, the righteous were conscious in some way. And, you know, I read and they were quoting, you know, here's one passage from Luther where it clearly looks like soul sleep. Here's another passage from Luther where it looks like, like a, and they're going back and forth and arguing it with one another, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I'll say this, even though I hope I don't insult either of my uh, Lutheran brothers and sisters. Luther was not a systematic thinker. Uh, he was a very passionate thinker, a very brilliant thinker. But as my reading of Luther, and I've read Luther off and on over the years, he doesn't seem to worry a whole lot about being consistent, right? He's very polemical, right? He's very argumentative, Luther. Not, not that that's a bad thing. He had to be polemical to accomplish what he did. But uh, he doesn't seem to be as worried about being precise as Calvin and trying to make all this stuff systematic, right? And by the way, don't think I'm insulting Luther in comparison to Calvin. 
Uh, there are some times I wish Calvin had been a lot more inconsistent than he was. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm reading him, okay. Um, you know, when I'm reading Calvin, you know, I'm reminded of Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, comment that consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, right? So, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. All right, any questions uh, you folks might have about the rich man in Lazarus or uh, the Luke before we move on? On the Luke statement, I think over the last few days, we've been thinking about where was Jesus between the crucifixion and disappearing and showing up again. And I had neglected to see that the other thief said, Today, or he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Good point, friend. And you know what's really interesting about that? At least to me, from a you know what being a philosopher and trying and wanting consistency of some sort. How do we reconcile this Luke passage with today you will be with me in paradise with the traditional Christian belief that during those three days Christ went and harrowed hell? And there's even a reference in the New Testament to him going and preaching to the spirits that were in captive, right? And there's all kinds of Christian mythology, not in the Bible, that talks about Jesus. I mean, very dramatic. He walks right up to the gates of hell and screams, you know, or not scream, but he, you know, commandingly says, Satan, come out and hand over the keys. And then Satan, of course, whimpers and cowers out, and Jesus takes the keys and unlocks the gate, and all the righteous dead come floating out because they're so glad to be relieved. Right? But how do you reconcile that, right? This harrowing of the hell thing uh, with this. Now, of course, you know, I'm not saying we have to reconcile the mythology with the Bible, uh, but it does give one pause. Huh? Well, maybe he took the thief to paradise and he said, hey, I'll be back later for tea or something. I got work to do right now. I got to go harrow hell. Who knows? Yeah. Like I said, all this stuff is highly speculative uh, in trying to systematize it. Let's move on then to the next one, uh, Michael, since I don't want to run, I probably will. Uh, here's one of Paul's statements, which clearly is a resurrection uh, statement. Uh, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare by the word of the Lord that we are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of triumph or a cry of command, with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So Paul is clearly saying uh, that there will be a resurrection of the dead. And part of what's going on in the Thessalonian community, according to New Testament scholars, is that there were Christians that were worried about their dead loved ones. Are they going to miss out on the kingdom of God since they died before Jesus returned? And so Paul is saying, no, uh, they will not be lost, right? But that they will be raised uh, and be with the Lord. Okay. But notice they'll meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. It's a little ambiguous there, right? As you know, uh, are, are we going to be in the air with the Lord forever? Or does it just mean we'll meet him in the air and then we'll be with him forever, right? In some other place. It's not quite clear, is it? By the way, this passage, uh, for some of you that may know this type of theology, uh, this is a verse that's often used uh, to justify belief in the rapture by some evangelical uh, Christians. Yeah. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, this is Paul again, and I won't read the whole thing. I'll let you folks just read it. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, this is a resurrection statement. If the earthly tent is destroyed, we have a building of God, eternal in the heavens. Uh, and by the tent, of course, he's talking about our bodies. Uh, 
uh, we will not be unclothed, but be further clothed so that the mortal may be swallowed up. So, and this is related in a sense to Paul's notions in 1 Corinthians 15 about our body being sown a terrestrial body and raised a spiritual body, but it is a body, keep in mind, right? It's not just some immaterial thing, it is a body. Uh, and then uh, you get it. All right, let's go to the next one, Michael, because I've got to run out of time here and I just want to be sure I, you know. And then of course we have this statement from Revelation, which is clearly a resurrection one, but this is the one that I want to uh, call to your attention because uh, one of the current uh, leading New Testament scholars, N.T. Wright, uh, and we'll get into uh, him in just what little time I've got left. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So notice that this conception of the afterlife that you have in Revelation is not existing in some immaterial place. But rather, this city is coming down to earth. And there will be a new, you know, if you keep reading that chapter, a new heaven and a new earth, right? With this holy city on this new earth. And this is what N.T. Wright uh, says uh, about this. Uh, and I'll just uh, read this quick quote. Uh, he was defending the primacy of the resurrection uh, in the Christian faith. And he was interviewed in Time Magazine in 2008. And he said this, the idea of bodily resurrection that people deny when they talk about their souls going to heaven, said, I've often heard people say, I'm going to heaven soon and I won't need this stupid body there, thank goodness. That's a very damaging distortion, all the more so for being unintentional. In the Bible, we are told that you die and enter an intermediate state. I believe this to be conscious, but compared to being bodily alive, it will be like being asleep. This will be followed by the resurrection into new bodies. Our culture is very interested in life after death, but the New Testament is much more interested in what I call life after life after death. So uh, N.T. Wright is uh, one of the foremost champions of this uh, of the current theologians uh, defending this idea of the importance of bodily resurrection and not simply some kind of immaterial existence. Okay. And by the way, uh, when Christianity emerged in the ancient world, uh, if Greek philosophers heard them preaching about the resurrection of the dead. That's one of the reasons why Paul says that the gospel appears to be foolishness to the Greeks. The Greeks could swallow the idea of an immortal soul that continued on without a body, but the idea that God would actually resurrect us from the dead and reconstitute us as physical beings uh, would have been seen as just foolishness to them. Okay, we can take the screen down now, I think, Michael, uh, unless somebody has a question about the screens. And we've got a few minutes left. Uh, so any questions, comments? I've tried to cover way too much here today, but uh, oh well. Questions, comments? Uh, Brian, this is Lee. I, oh, hey, Lee. I'm using my phone for the first time to Zoom, so I'm hoping it's coming through. Um, Everything except your lovely face. Your voice is fine. Well, that's well, that's a good thing. <laughs> I, I will save people that agony. Um, having died and crossed over and gone to heaven, uh -huh. and even while I was in heaven, going up to what Paul referred to as the third heaven. Uh -huh. um, 
coming back, everything in the scriptures I find is 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. However, people's interpretations of it are a bit different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my, my comment is relating to one concept where Christianity and Judaism differs from all the other world's religion. And that actually relates to uh, Hebrews 9.27, which talks about you live uh, 27, 28, you live once, then you're judged, you die, and then you're judged. Mm -hmm. uh, versus we get recycled back here and get to live again. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is it possible that the intermediary step is merely a restaging area. Well, that's an intriguing question, Lee. Uh, you know, Augustine uh, would, uh, as I mentioned, and not have a problem with that if you thought about the intermediate step as a place of uh, purification, of growth, and of development. Um, you know, there are folks that, you know, uh, the Roman Catholic notion of purgatory is very similar to that idea of there being an afterlife that's uh, some kind of uh, uh, process other than uh, simply being gone. Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, the judgment, I mean, you know, uh, Augustine would say, yeah, you die and you're judged. And it, but uh, yeah, it's quite possible. I mean, you know, again, when we get into this, it's all, it's very, very speculative, isn't it? Personally, I find the most persuasive version of the afterlife that I've ever read <laughs> is C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. Uh, and, you know, it's a, fiction, it's a fiction book, but Lewis describes what he thinks might take place in the afterlife in this story. And I have to admit that for me, it's probably the, well, it is the most plausible version of the afterlife uh, for Christians uh, that I think I've ever read, even better yeah. than what I've seen done by professional uh, theologians. Yeah. My, my father's house has many rooms, mm -hmm. and each of those rooms are actually different levels. And, you know, what some people call purgatory different interpretations yes there's levels that would represent that uh -huh. but the bottom line is that once a person passes through and i've been through with a lot of people who have died and experienced the same thing i did of the bliss and the love of the level of heaven when it shines down on us and when you leave the body and you go to that level and uh, it, is it a, it, it appears to be more of a holding area so that, yes, we are then purified more so that we can go to even higher levels, mm -hmm. so that it is a never ending journey of the soul and not just, okay, we uh, left our bodies and, and, and which leads to the next question, which is when you start reading John, like John 14, where Jesus says, the things that I do and even more you shall do. And if I exist in you, my father that is in me is also in you. What you realize is, is that the goal is transcendence, not necessarily waiting until we die. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, yeah, certainly uh, many Christian uh, theologians, Augustine, uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, well, Thomas Aquinas, I mean, a lot of great uh, Christian theologians, I think, would agree with you uh, that, yes, in the afterlife, there's still a continuous process of development that takes place. Yeah. I'm curious, though, if, you know, we claim that, you know, we believe that Jesus died for our sins. The power of sin is broken. That's what we're celebrating today. Um, if that is if Jesus has broken the power of sin, why do we need more purification after death? Okay, well, uh, to say it this way, to enable us to enjoy God's presence more and more. In other words, it's a growth in understanding, right? 
that as we continue to develop, yes, sin has been broken, but you know, having sin broken is just the first step, right? There's justification, and if we, you can use the $10 theological words, there's justification and there's sanctification. And so what's taking place after death among, you know, Augustine, some of these other people would say, is an ongoing process of sanctification that we continue to grow in our closeness and awareness and understanding of God uh, even after death. I mean, if you think about it this way, right? If we don't grow after we die, right, in some way, right, to improve and everything, wouldn't the afterlife, assuming it lasts as long as the Bible thinks it's going to, wouldn't that get incredibly tedious? <laughs> Unless there's something new to invigorate us, our minds, our bodies, whatever. You know, and that's what, you know, Aquinas tries to deal with this issue. Aquinas, you know, he's saying, some have said the afterlife will be uh, boring, tedious. I forget exactly the word, how it's translated. And he says, no, because God is an eternal, never-ending source of truth, goodness, and beauty. And the longer we are in the presence of God, the more we will appreciate that. So it's not, the afterlife, at least as Augustine, Aquinas, it's not stagnant. We're going to continue to grow as human beings, uh, even in the afterlife. That doesn't mean we don't, uh, that our sins haven't been forgiven. They have, right? But uh, I would certainly hope uh, that as those of us that have been Christians for a while, that we can look back on our walk with God and see that we have indeed grown as people from where we first started or grown as Christians from where we first started. Does that make sense? You're not buying it, but okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Well, all, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lee. Uh, Brian. Uh, Lee, can we let somebody that's not spoken yet? And then I'll get back to absolutely, you. Time absolutely. Because absolutely. I want to give more people a chance. Hey, Carl, was that you going to say something? Yeah, just to, to point out only an observation, the, this is all after the infection, if you will, of sin into the, the human race. If we look, and of course, if we take literally or even allegorically the story of Genesis, before the introduction of sin into humans, Adam, mankind, human, walk and talk directly with God. So there was no that the if we if we look at salvation and and the resurrection as getting back to that initial state, there wasn't apparently a, a further purification necessary. That was Adam Adam and Eve walked with God. So I I don't know what to make of that, but that's that's my problem with the we we got to get more pure even after we are in heaven to 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 do something that to me that it i just can't get away from the notion that okay if it's not salvation by works it's still you're there but you're not quite there and maybe that's the way it is but i i struggle with that well let me let's drop the word purification then i mean that's the one that augustine wanted to use what and let's just use the word spiritual growth. I mean, that, that may be a more palatable way of thinking about it uh, than purification. Uh, you know, among a lot of these ancient, uh, like Augustine, uh, you know, they equate spiritual growth with a kind of purification, with becoming more Christ-like. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're saved by that growth, but the growth is a process of the fact that you have been redeemed. And as far as Adam and Eve, that's a great point, Carl. I'll have to think about that a little bit. I have to wonder this, because we don't know from the story, right? That's why these stories are so intriguing. And I'll get to Michael in just a minute. He's had his hand up for a while. But one of the reasons these stories are so intriguing, we know Adam and Eve walked with God, right? Had they not sinned and been expelled from the garden, and Adam and Eve will assume that they're pretty young, right? Of course, we don't know how long they were in the garden, according to the story, right? You know, they may have been there overnight, and then boom, you're gone. Uh, who knows? But then anyway, 
My point being, if Adam and Eve, even if they did walk with God, they're really in kind of a still as human beings in kind of an infancy with God, kind of young with God. And maybe had they not got kicked out of the garden, they would have come or would have grown and had a deeper appreciation from God. We just don't know, right? But that's a great question you raised, Carl. Great question. Michael. Um, I, I, I'm sort of wanted to ask about, you know, Jesus in Matthew 25, etc., talks about, you know, the father that will be the sheep and the goats reward system um, in the afterlife where, and Jesus also we are told is going to his kingdom will reign forever. And the impression I get from the New Testament is that there's going to be a reward system for faithfulness in this life as a Christian. And it, the, the, the kingdom of God is going to keep getting built, you know, and there's, there's actually going to be work done beyond this life. Mm -hmm. um, so isn't it fair to think that in addition to spiritual growth, there's also actually work going to be done, which would be a lot more fun than what we are doing here now. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, what do you think? Well, let me just read you something, uh, Michael, that will fit, I think, what's it. And I'll try to do this quickly. First Corinthians, the passage I mentioned in First Corinthians 3, right? And by the way, it does say clearly in Revelation, behold, I come quickly and I will judge every man according to his works, right? Now, we Protestants have a hard time with works. I understand that. But works are a part of it, right? But listen, here's Paul talking about... Uh, According to God's grace, I laid the foundation like a wise master builder, and now someone else is building on it. Everyone should take care how they build on it. Nobody can lay any foundation, you see, except the one which is laid. This foundation is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, grass, or straw, well, everyone's work will become visible because the day will show it up, since it will be revealed in fire. Then the fire will test what sort of work everyone has done. If the building work that someone has done stands the test, they will receive a reward. If someone's work is burned up, they will be punished by bearing the loss. They themselves will be saved, however, but only as if through a fire, hmm. right? So Michael, that would fit very much with what you're saying about there being rewards or there being, you know, I mean, I don't know that it will be, you know, the kind of thing I can remember uh, in Eastern Kentucky, they used to sing this hymn that used to drive me nuts uh, about, uh, you know, because it was kind of a self-righteousness works thing, but it was, will there be any stars in my crown? Mm. Right? Meaning what kind, you know, for heaven's sakes, you know, I, I'm not worried about getting the crown. If I can slide through the door, I'm going to be happy, right? You know, but there might be, <laughs> there, there might be plenty of people, you know, that, but, but see, that's kind of a physical way of thinking about it, isn't it? And, and I think sometimes people get into this immaterial way of thinking about the actual life in part to try to correct some of the abuses of these physical ways of thinking. You know, it's like, you know, uh, you know, I can remember people saying, you know, because the book of Revelation says this, you know, oh, down here, I don't have much. But in heaven, I will walk on a street of pure gold. Right. And that's what he said. The city will have a street of pure, not heaven, but the new Jerusalem. Right. It's going to have a street of pure gold. I don't want to walk on gold. <laughs> that has no attraction to me whatsoever, right? Anyway, sorry. Carol's telling me I need to hush because time's up, uh, which I need to be told. Uh, yeah, it is time to go. Uh, let's see. Sorry, Lee. Brian, that I wouldn't Brian why don't you close with prayer? Don't I'll look for someone else. Call on somebody else. Mm -mm. Go ahead. Just me. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Then. Gracious God, source of all truth, goodness, and beauty. And on this day, we commemorate as the source of life. Thank you for an opportunity to think about things from your word and things for our lives. But most of all, we give thanks on this day for the resurrection of your son, 
the one you sent to deliver us from the power of death, the grave, and hell. For we ask these things in Christ's name, praising you forever. Amen. Let's, as we usually do, unmute and thank Brian for good brain food. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Easter. Thank, thank you, Brian. Great. Happy Easter to all. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.